Cool. Okay, yeah, you're live. Um, so hi everybody. This is Abhigyan, College Counseling Prefect. Um, welcome to the first of the alumni webinar series we have scheduled for the next week. Today we have with us Josh Mahipal. So Josh, if you could just give a brief introduction about yourself, that would be great. Yeah, um, nice to meet you all. Um, so I was in TISB from 11-12, uh, so just came for the IB. And after graduating, I uh, started my undergrad at UC Berkeley. Um, where I kind of majored in economics and minored in computer science. Um, after graduation, sort of I worked in an economic consulting firm in Menlo Park. And then after that, kind of decided to pivot into the uh, tech sector, uh, specifically the fintech. So for the past um, couple of years, I've been working in London and um, just kind of finishing my four year mark. Now um, I'll be starting my MBA at London Business School uh, starting this August. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of a brief few things about me. OK, thank you so much, Josh. So I think we'll start with our questions now. So uh, just so all the attendees know the format that we're going to be following. So we're going to be mm -hmm. talking about college life and college academics, and then we're going to end with a QA. and a um, So you guys have a, a chat box which you can use to ask any questions you have, and then we'll make sure to address them at the end of the session. So I think let's just start off with uh, the first question, which is why did you personally choose Berkeley? Um, yeah, I mean, so personally, I had never visited Berkeley before going. Uh, however, um, in TISB, I worked kind of closely with the college counseling department, and one of my counselor was uh, Miss Pamela Clone. Um, so kind of after talking to her, who had some more idea, I think she recommended um, that maybe kind of Berkeley would be a good fit, or in general, the UC uh, system, because just kind of my interest were kind of varied, um, and also kind of I like to be a bit more involved on campus. Um, so that kind of brought me to kind of applying to the UC. Uh, and then the other thing was um, I'm, I cannot also like live in the cold weather. Um, so I kind of always decided like I want to be on the West Coast. So that anyways kind of narrowed down my selection. Um, so Berkeley sort of worked out. And uh, I think back at then when I didn't quite did my re um, visit, I think just kind of looking over, talking to a few people and like Miss Pamela, I think kind of Berkeley resonated well with me at that point. OK, thank you very much. So now we know how you arrived at the process of choosing your college. So for the next question, what was your expectation or idea of college before you went and how significantly did the reality differ from what you had in your mind before starting college? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing was like, um, so when kind of you write all the applications, you kind of talk a lot about, um, especially with people who write um, like statement of purpose. Uh, for the UK and then you write all the essays, it's very academic heavy. Um, you kind of talk about all the research you've done and how much you're so passionate about the subject. And you sort of expect that when you get there, um, all the academic coursework would be very aligned with you. And like how in like at school, um, everything is kind of tailored for us. Um, I kind of expected the same at college versus it was a completely different feeling. Like it seems like there's you don't know any individual faculty, especially when you get there, and especially a school like Berkeley, um, it's sort of impossible to kind of build that relationship on day one. Um, so just kind of being out there um, with like mu much less support, I think was definitely kind of thing I'd not expected. Um, and I think very soon you realize that you need to um, chart your own course. Um, and like you have all like college has a lot of resources in general, like any of the colleges. It's kind of more like you need to go out there and find what's your fit and uh, no one's going to do that for you. I think that was the big difference between what I'd expected and what I found out. Wow, OK, so that's really interesting. And you spoke about different opportunities that are available. What about in terms of student life? So what type of opportunities are available off campus, on campus, clubs, activities? And what did you personally participate in? Yeah, so I mean, um, I would say at least like experience at Berkeley, um, is incomplete without being part of any student club. Um, if you kind of just focus on academics, great, but I think a big part of the education is also just being very active in the student clubs. And I think student clubs uh, extended right from like something like a dance class or like salsa or tango all the way to like professional clubs. And um, personally, um, during my four years, I was heavily involved with one of the student like led pro bono management consulting clubs. 
because I sort of realized I want to get into consulting. Um, and I think what was surprising to me was like, yeah, you might be interested in a few of those clubs, but how competitive it is just to get in, like even the process of, it's not like, hey, you've entered Berkeley, so every you can join any club you want. Even getting in another club is like another layer, layer of application. And um, I think once you kind of get in that application process, you sort of realize which club is a good fit or not. And I think so the student consulting club really helped me a lot in terms of making my own community with like where I found my closest friends um, for three years at least. And then also I was also part of like the Indian Student Association where um, it's like a group of friendly people who organize holy for like 8000 people. So kind of found a club which kind of serves my professional interest and at the same time found a club which helps me on like the cultural side of things and have some fun. And apart from that, um, you have all the activities to choose from in the sense like you could be involved. Like I think Berkeley has a set of courses called decals where um, they are classes led by students and you get credits for that. And those classes uh, serve the purpose of you exploring your passion. So it could literally be like you could join a Quidditch class or you could join a wine society or you could join like Argentine tango. And there are like hundreds of those and you can totally come up with a proposal and write what you want to lead and like students can take that class and get credits. So I think being out there and being actively searching for these clubs I would definitely enhance your college life, but especially in a school like Berkeley where it's kind of very big and the career center isn't really supporting you or holding your hand. It's the professional clubs uh, which really help you to uh, find your bearings and like navigate your journey out. OK, that was quite insightful. And I think one of the biggest things we gained out of this is the fact that like independence is a very major factor when it comes to college. And so with independence, there are some like stress factors also associated. So how would you say were the mental health facilities at your college and were many students unable to cope with the pressure and how was the general environment? So um, again, to, to kind of preface you in general, right? So Berkeley attracts, I think, uh, 5000 students every uh, academic year. Um, at the same time, it's a state school. So you have a big diversity, not just in terms of um, the people it attracts on nationalities, but like it means the socioeconomic levels. Um, so of course, there are people who have different levels of stress given the position they come from. Uh, and in general, from what um, I personally had not used any um, counseling service, but from the people who I know did use it, uh, they spoke highly about it. There's definitely like the college hospital um, and everything's very pr private and people actually respect that. Um, at least unlike kind of being a taboo, um, I think people are very much open to the idea of like, hey, I'm not doing well in the classes. Uh, can I get some help? Uh, yes, there's help for you for academic resources. There's also help for you just kind of dealing socially. Um, if you kind of have any trouble. So I think definitely it's very accessible. I think it's more about people actively seeking those than I think some people just choose to keep it on the downside and like get on with it. But I think um, if you want to seek it, there's definitely resources that you could go out and seek help. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a great support system. Um, so on a lighter note, uh, what would you describe as the typical student at Berkeley? Um, so I think um, again, like it's probably cliche, there is no typical student, like especially being in a liberal arts school. Uh, a typical student really depends on the major. Like I think it's dictated by the major you are. Um, so I did economics and I minored in computer science, so I can speak a bit about those two. So at least for people who are interested in economics, I think your typical week would look. Um, your your course load isn't that heavy unless you choose to make it so like it's very manageable in the four years you have um, and you do get projects in between with a few coursework here and there, but a lot of people are involved in economics. They are also pretty involved with the student clubs, so that's where most like that's where the time is divided. And at the same time, uh, a lot of my friends who were studying economics, they also interned in the San, in San Francisco, which is like just a 20 minute um, ride away from bus or a metro or a 15 minute Uber. So People who kind of study economics are involved in like doing their courseworks, uh, like getting in, sitting in the lectures during the day, and then the other half kind of going to San Francisco working, uh, especially in like this junior senior year. And then at least in the first and sophomore years, they kind of like pretty much involved with the student clubs and 
especially most of the economic students are kind of involved either in some sort of a professional fraternity. It's called the business fraternity, which is different from the Greek life on the social side. And at the same time as the consulting clubs um, where they kind of work with clients on and off basis. Um, as a, on the contrary, someone who's a computer science student or like an electrical engineering NCS, um, the course load is significant. Um, and when by course load, I mean it's your um, like just the projects you have for computer science could take definitely like 50, 60 hours. So that's when I think people are kind of less. Uh, I wouldn't say like people on social people who balance things well. They manage. They have a good balance out, but then on average, they're a lot more busy with the projects on a daily basis. Um, and then I think the typical day changes as you progress, right? Like the first years, you have a lot more time to kind of devote to academics um, during your um, junior summer people everyone wants to intern so they're spending a lot of time uh, networking the good thing of um, being located at berkeley is you're just 20 minutes away from san francisco where a most of the tech companies are out there most of the consulting banking companies are out there so it really makes it easier for you to network and go to these companies events and kind of um, get in that process um, so yeah i think uh, there wouldn't be a typical day, but if it were like it really depends on the major and what your life goals are. At the same time, you could completely choose to um, even within economics, you could choose a very academic path. So I have friends in economics who've chosen to kind of pursue the PhD path, and that's when they spend a lot more time with the professors, um, spend time um, as a teaching assistant and working on like helping the professors on research on the side. So I think it really depends on what your goals are at the end of the day. That's that sounds pretty good because I think like it you made it sound like there's no dearth of opportunities for someone who you know just wants to go out and grab them. So with that kind of thing being said, what is the student culture like in general? Like are the students very competitive, very driven or is there more focus on just collaboration as a whole? Um, I would say there are certain majors that are very competitive um, and you see the ugly side of things, to be honest. Um, like. Not a kind of badger one major, but then like I remember being in one of the classes and um, the class is literally ranked on a percentile basis and students were like after like. Whatever you score, you're ranked and they're like 500 students and like there's a cutoff for making to a certain grade. So there are people who are very competitive in classes like those, but those are usually the video classes. And by video classes, I mean, let's say people who want to do. A minor or major in computer science. Um, there's an introductory class called CS61A, where um, currently at Berkeley, from what I remember, there are 1500 to 2000 people who enroll every year, every semester. Now, of course, um, no major would have 15 like 2000 people in it. So what they do is they allow everyone at like all these introductory classes is allow everyone to kind of, hey, why don't you just sit in and take it? And then the mid semesters are designed in a way to kind of only um, allow the people who are really serious and motivated to pursue it versus a lot of people who are just doing it for because hey, it's CS yes, and it's a hype uh, might leave after it. So you do see the competitive side over there, but once you kind of move towards the electives and the upper divisions, you definitely you can kind of like sit in a smaller setting. So I've been in at Berkeley, I've been in class of 1500, which was very competitive. At the same time in my senior, I was um, with the professor only. He was the chair of the economics department in a 15 person classroom setting where it's very collaborative. The professor knows you on a one to one level, so it really depends on the classes you do take and um, and the people you choose to surround yourself with. Interesting. So it looks like there's uh, both ends of the spectrum at Berkeley. Um, so I think you briefly mentioned prefer, pro professional fraternities before. So what is Greek like li uh, Greek life like at campus? And uh, do you think that people who don't participate feel left out in any way? Yeah, so um, when I said the professional fraternities, um, keep in mind like that doesn't reflect the Greek life. That's pretty much like here I want to uh, get into investment banking, so I'm going to join a professional fraternity. They're just called fraternity for the sake of it. Um, the Greek life, which I think people usually allude to, um, would be kind of the social side and um, Berkeley definitely had a thriving Greek life, but I personally was not involved in none of, like either of my friends. Um, so no, if you don't feel comfortable or you don't think Greek life is meant for you, uh, there's definitely an alternative equally better. 
Um, that being said, like I like being part of the Greek life also has its benefits, um, especially in recruiting, kind of building a network, and also it's like, hey, you and like if you're going to the US, you're there for four years, like, um, and you want to get an American experience, a college experience, then yeah, like sure, why don't you just go ahead and explore the Greek life? Um, so I would definitely encourage everyone to at least in their first year or second year, just kind of go out to these events, meet people, see is it the fit for you? And if you think, and again, joining Greek life, um, it sounds fun, but there's a big part involved in actually when you get accepted to you joining, there's a semester where you have to go through a process. And if you're willing to put yourself up to that process for a semester, then sure. But again, if you don't join Greek life, I think, especially in a school like Berkeley, there's just so many opportunities that like you literally do not have to do things what is like a stereotype or what kind of people expect you to. You can like find your own niche and pretty much be happy with it. So Greek life is, I mean, from what I can understand from this is that Greek life is very subjective, but it is definitely something that should be explored at least once by everyone. And so, yeah. and I think you also mentioned like building a community and that it offers you like a sense of belonging. So a lot of that also comes, I think, from the housing you get and the food you get like on a day to day basis. So what do you what is your opinion about the dorms, like the housing situation on campus? What's the food like, especially as an Indian? Yeah, no. So again, um, so housing at Berkeley is limited. Um, so everyone stays on campus, like on campus housing for the first year. But I would say around 80 percent or so would leave, would live in a separate apartment after the first year just because um, it just doesn't have housing to host like 25,000 students. Um, so it would be very similar, in my opinion, to let's say like a state school where you start in the first in the dorms and then you move out. Now, in terms of food, um, the dorm food, again, ha it would cater to everyone's, everyone's appetite, um, like spice levels or any dietary restrictions you have, and it's pretty awesome. Um, but again, I think after a year, like I personally, um, like even in the between the first year, I kind of personally got bored um, and Again, uh, Berkeley has an amazing selection of food. Like if you ask me about any city, even like I can compare the food scene in Berkeley compared to like in London. Uh, it's just very diverse and I particularly kind of enjoyed uh, exploring different cuisines. And as an Indian, let's say you're vegetarian or you're not, um, there's no problem. Um, you would never kind of complain about the food on campus or off campus. But yeah, in terms of housing, um, at least at Berkeley, uh, people would leave um, the campus in their first like after the first year and kind of take another apartment pretty much like within like 500 walking distance from campus with a few of their friends oh, okay sounds good um and so sort of a more personal question is if you could change anything about berkeley what would it be um i think i kind of going back to the first point right like about when we were talking about the academic and like how competitive it is. I think being a school, you should allow people to um, pursue computer science if they want to and kind of build that interest um, instead of kind of making like having a reputation of like, hey, this class is so tough, like or making midterms in a way which kind of disappoint people and force them to leave. Um, I think it should be an environment where like, hey, you're interested in computer science, like it's fine. It's we know you haven't done it in IB before or you haven't done it in school, but then hey, we are here to kind of support you in that journey. So like instead of ramping it up to 100, they could have a like a lesser intense version and at least educate the people who are interested in exploring computer science because I feel the way it's done right now, and I think it's also pretty much the constraint um, being a public school. They don't have much resources to kind of devote um, to allow people to explore majors, especially the more popular ones like CS, and I think they could do a better job. I know they have kind of started a course now where like you do it with a software called Scratch, like it's a very intuitive way of learning, but then if you're serious about pursuing a mind, you have to do like those core classes and a lot of people drop out, which I think it's pretty sad, like you should allow people to explore their interest and like have an environment where people are less worried about their grades and more worried about and like more interested in learning. And I think being a public school uh, for the competitive majors, it's um, they mean it like the curve is like to an B minus. 
um, sometimes so like a two like 2.7 or a 3.0 GPA where like some of the private schools like Stanford would just have a higher mean. So people are very worried about like, hey, I want to apply to an MBA after they're worried about, hey, how's my transfer going to look like? And I think because they're so worried, they take uh, they don't explore their majors, even though they have time um, on their hands to do that. So I think one of the most important things you mentioned here was like the level of academic rigor and competition. So yeah. specific to you, like in general, how many hours of lectures and homework did you have per week? Like is the workload manageable and any personal tips that you have for us as we move into college to keep so, up with the work and still explore everything else? Yeah, no, so I think firstly, like, um, I mean, I had friends who applied from like Cathedral and like other like non IB schools who did like the ICSE and um, other programs like IB definitely puts you in a great spot. Uh, with kind of what you learn at like the ISB, like the few of like especially in the high levels, it already kind of allows you knowing a few things and it helps you with the introductory classes. Um, one thing I would say people who are kind of if they know the school they want to go um, or they want to target, they could probably start looking at. Um, so every school kind of gives you credits for doing for some of the pre coursework. So let's say I want to do economics and there's a microeconomic macroeconomics course. And there's a calculus courses or uh, 1A, 1B. If you've done math high level, you could skip those. So if you're serious about like you know the schools, um, it's definitely like doing IB definitely helps you to um, skip few of those core classes and get ahead. And I think getting ahead helps you in terms of choosing your classes and gives you more time to kind of doing those electives than again brushing up your core, which you've just done that in May before, like during your finals. Um, that being said, um, I think your coursework is pretty much up to you how you want to tailor it. Um, you can definitely get away with the requirements for graduation, right? Like if there is, I think 120 credits, you have four years, eight semesters, you can to you'll totally be able to breeze through it. Um, of course, there are some classes which require more work, so there there would be classes which would require like some like one week it would require 80 hours, um, other week it require 10 hours. So it really depends on how kind of structure like how balanced like I guess how do you manage your coursework right like are you how many classes are you taking are you taking one intense classes or you take like are you taking like three regular and I think you need to be aware of like how involved do you want to be with your social life um, and by social life I mean like the clubs so if you want to be let's say you want to be a president um, of a student club then that is going to require some time on your hand then you could consciously Kind of like take a like choose to take a lesser workload at the same time um, in your senior semester where um, you have recruitment you have you're spending a lot of time in like interviews you could choose to kind of take the tougher classes early on um, so I think it's manageable it's up to you there is no structure where you're saying like hey you have to take this class at this time um, it's up to you and if you know your priorities how do you manage that Interesting. So looks like uh, it's it depends on the person and how they decide to structure their own course load. So outside of college academics, how do you how did you find and how did your friends find internships and uh, what was that process like? Yeah, so um, I can I mean I can only speak about consulting and like consulting, banking and tech. Um, and again, uh, to keep in mind, like it's from a very um, biased perspective because I was part of a student club. Uh, one thing I can say is um, Berkeley being a state school, they have a lot more applications than companies are recruiting. So let's say you want to find a job at McKinsey or Bain um, like full time. There would probably be like 10 openings, but there would be like 150 people applying. It wouldn't be the same as Stanford because they just have a relatively few people. So everyone who kind of is like going towards the popular career tracks and I'm talking about non-engineering. Um, Kind of more towards consulting and banking those firstly you need to get an interview and a lot of the interviews are given to people who are part of some club or the other um, so at berkeley there were kind of like mainly there were six to seven clubs and the reason that works is because again let's say you want to find a job at an, one of the consulting companies the people who are giving out those interviews are usually first years or second years um, who've just kind of recently graduated and started. Those are the people who are reading your first like your resumes and giving the interviews. Now, just because already there's so many people in these clubs, like 
300 or so, they're given preference over the others. So if you're part of one of those consulting clubs, um, it's just an easier walk. Like I knew for a fact, like, hey, I got in the consulting club, getting all the interviews would, like, it's kind of guaranteed um, you will get it. Um, this, the flip side is like people who aren't, uh, let's say you have, you have not net, like, not part of any of the clubs is definitely very difficult for them, not impossible, but they just need to go the extra mile and like reach out to the recruiters, um, go to the presentations and like say, hey, do you want to get a coffee and then go to San Francisco uh, in the evenings after classes and get a coffee with someone and do the networking. So I think um, if you're kind of certain it's like, hey, I want to be in banking or uh, consulting, then definitely be like join one of the professional clubs, at least at Berkeley. It just makes your life super easy, like easy, and you have just a lot more re resources at your disposal. At the same time, people who have kind of gone the engineering path, uh, people who've done computer science and eeks, tech companies do not care um, much about like even your GPA, for example. Um, it's more of like they will give out interviews to most of the people. Now, then it's about like, hey, people really need to kind of prepare for that interview. Uh, so I think if you want to get into like as an engineer, as a software engineer, then you can kind of focus less time on your uh, networking, more time on prepping for the interview. If you want to kind of go towards consulting banking, I would say like sadly it's pretty much dictated by how much do you network and do you know the people who are um, like reading your resume? Because like again, reading a resume, it just puts you on a level playing field. If you're not, you are in disadvantage. So I think we've gained a very detailed perspective on how the clubs work at Berkeley and why it's so important that you should be a part of the ones you're like interested in for your industry. But apart from clubs, what other academic or non-academic opportunities are available? For example, teaching assistantships and the likes. And how do you make the best use of those opportunities available to you? Yeah, so, um, so again, not all classes offer a uh, teaching assistant um, because what you, so just to give a concept of what TA is um, at Berkeley, it's usually each class is kind of led by a professor who kind of does the lectures and then you break out into smaller discussions. Those discussions are led by teaching assistants. Um, usually these teaching assistants are PhDs um, who are helping the professors because usually the TAs also get subsidized by the campus. In most cases, the tuition is paid by Berkeley if you're a TA and even at other schools. So it is a competitive position. Uh, however, as an undergrad, let's say you do exceptionally well in a class like get an A plus, which usually reserved for uh, like, of course, being exceptional and being very passionate, then you kind of strike that conversation with your professor and you show that active interest um, and there are like certain quizzes that you can take and be a TA. If you do become a TA, um, it especially helps if you want to pursue masters immediately after your undergraduation. So. I have a few friends who just after kind of finishing their bachelor's in computer science decided to pursue a PhD in robotics and they had that uh, connect with the professor who would later kind of help him to kind of support with a recommendation. So if you want to take that path, you can definitely um, explore that as a TA um, and other schools also like you need to kind of just be very proactive with the professor, make sure you kind of spend that time and take the initiative of like introducing yourself and explain, hey, this is what you're interested in. Um, at the same time, um, if you want to be involved outside of like the TA stuff and just do your own research, there are also ways where uh, professors definitely help you. Even their classes where like I've taken a class where I spent a semester exploring one of my thesis. So you can totally choose to be very involved academically um, if you want to and even a place like Berkeley, which is big, professors always open um, to you doing that. Um, and then let's say if you wanna, you leave the student clubs and you leave the jobs aside, let's say you just wanna explore a passion, right? Like it could be um, like a sailing club or whatever you want, like a cooking club, you can definitely do that at Berkeley. Like you can be involved in religious organizations and at the same time, like be involved in the nonprofit. Like you can be, like you could be volunteering and helping kind of Berkeley do that. And the other, Part which people usually forget um, is like there's a student government. So a lot of people actively choose to run for the student government at Berkeley and like represent people. Like that is again very prestigious and like you are part of the entire like 
you're working with the entire UC system um, and like you're running elections, uh, you kind of putting your voice. So it's up to you like how like are your interests more aligned towards getting a job or do you want to explore uh, the academic side to join a PhD program or you're just interested in leadership and coming back? OK, that's that's really interesting. Um, what do you think the education like? Is it mostly theoretical or um, is does it like the your your courses and things? Were there were there hands on opportunities and projects uh, which you also had to complete? No, I think it's def definitely very hands on. Um, I like all the class classes I've done. Um, it's not like the system where you can just be home uh, for a semester like not go to any classes and then just decide to cram two weeks before the class and like study for the final of the midterm and get your grade because a big part of your grade is the regular homeworks and the projects um, especially in computer science like i would say the final is only like probably 20 percent of the grade in some classes and 80 percent is just your projects um, and those tend to be very hands-on um, um like to give an example um like in computer like especially in computer science like there would be courses where you're designing like you're doing your entire project about like analyzing twitter sentiments or like um, making your own version of dropbox so like there are definitely projects like those um and they end, end up being very practical to the point like you can talk about it in when you're recruiting um same goes for economics like the one of the classes that done economics of discrimination was very applied and the paper I had written uh, definitely helped me along with my contact to getting my first job. And even after that, um, within my job, like it helped me to kind of just talk about one of my research. So I think, yeah, it's definitely very hands on, but at the same time, like there are classes which are very theoretical. Like if you're doing like a pure math class, um, the nature itself is like aligned towards more towards theory. But if you're doing something like computer science class, um, again, there are classes which are very practical and their classes which are very theoretical so it's up like again it's your choice i think one common thing that i see from berkeley is like you can choose to do whatever you want like given it's big school and given it has to cater to the interest of twenty five thousand people it's tried its best to kind of um, make a system where everyone can explore uh, his or her interest and i think that's sort of the benefit of being in a very large school where you're not restricted to kind of trying out different majors or things or passion you, like you might want to explore. So with the hands on education, like being at the focus of like the education environment there, do you do you still think like that your college education has provided you with the skills you require in the industry? Because hands on as it may be, a lot of us have concerns that what we learn in college may even be outdated by the time we enter the industry. So how relevant has it been for you? Um, I would say it's um, given the work I have done and did, it's been 100% relevant. So my first uh, job was at this economic consulting firm called Coniston Research. Um, unlike other consultants where you're just making decks out, um, like the place I worked was very academic focused. Um, the nature of the work is you involve, you kind of work on projects um, which help to opine on a legal perspective. So let's say if two companies are merging, um, you often read like, hey, the merger of $5 billion failed. Who decides that $5 billion? That was kind of coming with the work, um, the firm I used to work at used to do. And you're always working with an expert. Now, these experts are academic experts. So one of the experts I'd worked on a discrimination case was Edward Lazier. He was a chief economic advisor at the White House. And he's the first, like he founded the entire field of economics called labor economics at Stanford. Um, so when you're kind of working with a professor like that, the research that helped me was, um, hey, I'd written this paper uh, and it, it directly applied to one of the cases we worked on. So even like when people say, hey, you're doing a lot of macroeconomic, microeconomics, like, of course, those graphs don't apply even to the real world. And I, like people know that, but a few of those classes where especially the electives, uh, that definitely parallels that you can draw in your day to day life. Now, computer science, 100 percent, right? Like you are literally kind of building software. So that's 100% applicable. Um, even courses like if you do like some of the upper division uh, economic courses, 
they completely apply or even like um, finance courses. So like the higher you kind of progress, especially in your senior year, you end up being in classes led by professors who are part of the industry. So people who are kind of interested in getting into investment banking or private equity, you're, you're actually sitting in a classroom um, who the professor teaches in the morning and then is going back to San Francisco to run his own company and to run his hedge fund. So, and through these interactions, they always end up being a mentor. So I know so many of my friends who've now had this professor as their mentor and like three, four years, even after graduation, when they want to kind of transition from investment banking into hedge fund, they would go and play golf with him and be like, hey, I would love your advice. So, and professors know that, right? Like since they're in the real world, so they also try to make their projects um, tailored. And again, that depends, like that's not possible for smaller class, like courses in your early times because they are led by so many people. They can't really know what people might be interested. But let's say in your junior year, you find a class and say like, hey, professor, I'm interested in exploring this perspective and they're more than happy to do so. Uh, let's say you want to go back to your family business and you, your family business kind of has a particular whatever industry could be, let's say steel. So you can talk about steel to an operation research professor saying, hey, I'm interested in learning the application of industrial engineering onto a steel plant. Can we explore that? They're more than happy to, but at the end of the day, you need to take that initiative and throw some light to the professor as to like, hey, where do you come from and what could help you um, to take away from this class? Yeah, that sounds amazing. I mean, especially having professors who are involved or were involved in industry. Um, so I think we're going to transition to questions uh, which uh, the attendees have asked now. And let's start with um, someone asked, how safe is the UCB campus given its vicinity to Oakland? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a funny one. Uh, I would say again, it was it wasn't the safest of the campuses. So like if you ever work in Stanford, like if you ever go to Palo Alto, like like I used to work there, I never cared about like walking at like 1 a.m. Uh, back like I just knew I'm safe at Berkeley. You definitely have to be conscious like you have to be aware of your surroundings. That being said, like nothing ever happened to me or my friends um, that I know like there are resources around. Let's say you want to study at the library late. Um, you can choose to walk with your friends back or let's say you are alone. You can just call the campus police and they'll send a bus to get you back. Um, but yeah, it's definitely like you, you'll be fine, but I would say, yeah, you have to sort of be aware of your surrounding. It's not like you can just walk around um, without any worries for sure. That's definitely something we'll keep in mind. Another question that came up was, was it hard to take the right CS course given you had it as a minor? So I think we can generalize the question to something like with the freedom you have in terms of the courses you can take, how hard is it to pick the right one? like it's totally up to you honestly so like you don't so the way minor works is right like minor or major you declare your major after you've sort of finished the courses so let's say you've done your um the course selection works on the prerequisites if you have those prerequisites um it definitely you kind of qualify for it now of course if you're part of a college so let's say cs is a part of college of engineering then few uh, each class has two codes so let's say you're booking a flight right it could be uh, Etihad flight at the same time it could be a jet airways flight they call it code share the similar thing sort of applies to <laughs> classes at Berkeley so let's say computer science 50 could be called EX 10 or could be called computer science 50 so and the seats are reserved in priority for the people who are in the college of engineering because the fewer students so um, they have an easier way getting in people who are in the college like the College of like uh, Liberal Arts or the College of Letters and Sciences, they go through the call like computer science code name. So for them, they have more people competing to get in. Um, that being said, I've not like come across anyone who's not being able to get in their class in one or two semesters here and there. Like in the end, you definitely get in and there's also like waitlist is maintained at these classes. So if you kind of really talk to the professor and very keen, you you definitely kind of can find a spot in after. Uh, you kind of need to be like, hey, I'm very interested. Uh, would be great if you kind of allow me uh, to sit in your class, even though I know it's for a junior, but as a sophomore, since I have so many credits, I would like to kind of take it early on. And I think this is where the benefit of having credits help because where your peers would be kind of 
spending the time the first two semesters doing some of the core classes. Having done IB, you can already skip those and get in the priority, which definitely helps towards the second and third year where you can you get the choices of your class sooner because especially at Berkeley, you enroll in classes based on the number of credits you have. So if you have more credits completed, uh, your appointment, which is handed out for you to preserve your classes, it comes in before other people. So you get a priority over that, like over others who might not. So I think, I don't know if that helps understanding the nuance of how kind of um, booking your resort, like reserving your class at Berkeley is like. Interesting. So looks like it's both a factor of what you're interested in and also maybe the availability depending on your own college and things like that. So yeah. um, um, you, men you, you mentioned that uh, your IB uh, HL subjects helped you skip some of the core um, classes. So someone's asked a question similar to that. Um, moving on into IB in the 11th grade, were there specific topics you found hard um, in IB? And maybe you can before that, you can probably mention which subjects you did take and um, how they've helped you in your uh, time at Berkeley. Yeah, so I mean, my high levels were like um, the sciences and economics, and then the standard levels were like English and Hindi. Um, so personally for me, it helped me mostly just only with economics and um, like the two calculus classes because of the math high level. Um, other people like who uh, whose majors are, let's say, uh, people who are kind of studying philosophy or rhetoric, like having English at the high level help them to kind of get like get away with one of the college writing classes. So I think it really depends on um, colleges, different requirements. Um, so I think yeah, like it's totally up to you in terms of high level. The other things also like AP. So like a lot of people on the side had also done like a few AP exams. I I wouldn't say like, hey, just because you get credits, like spend your time doing that. You could be spending your time at IB on a lot of other things, but then um, yeah, you can definitely kind of take those uh, advantage by saying, hey, I have these credits um, and can I just skip out of like a few of these classes that I have? And I think it'll just help you to get ahead of the system even like. But that being said, like if you want to take the. Um, like I know people who had taken the credit, I, they felt at that time they felt oh, it's great, um, but then I think in retrospect for them, it would have been good for just to polish it up because. Um, you. So let's say um, for few people, right? Like they have the credit and they choose to skip the um, initial class and move to the more of like the tougher elective in math. Um, now, great, you can do that, but then you don't have the fundamentals or maybe you're not in practice because you've had a break in between of five months. Um, so you're taking a tougher class where um, your first semester where like you want 100% sure you don't have your basics right and you don't get a good grade. On the other side, if you kind of just redo the same class, uh, you're still polishing up your fundamentals, you're understanding how Berkeley works, and it gives you a lot more time to like get tuned in the college, right? Like instead of hitting the road straight from like day one on academic front, you can kind of take it a slightly relaxed and still kind of do the classes which you could get credit for, um, but kind of still polish up on your fundamentals, um, get your GPA high from the very start, and then kind of take time into just adjust to the campus environment. So like. I wouldn't say like if you have credit, just use it. It depends how comfortable, how strong do you really think you are? Because I think a um, few of these schools, especially at Berkeley, I think you just needed over five and above uh, in your HL to get the credit. Um, so again, like if you've just gotten a five, um, how and let's say you've already gotten a college offer, like how many people have the uh, fundamentals polished versus someone who's gotten a seven and been like very like certain. So you also like, be introspective and be cautious of like, hey, you're getting credit, but do you think are you comfortable in the subject? Because if you're not, it's just going to bite you in the next classes you take. So we'll definitely be careful when we're basically deciding how to use a credit. And another one of the more popular questions was, what is the startup culture like at Berkeley? Like whether it be in comp science or finance, what's the startup culture like? No, I mean, it has a very, I mean, given uh, you and the Bay Area, like, everyone's thinking of startups like I I personally got into uh, like doing two on the side uh, just because everyone's always discussing about something or the other. Um, the computer science especially like the department it's super open to kind of supporting different projects. There's also like an incubator programs. Uh, there's a small VC fund that has now kind of started from like 
one of those uh, student clubs and there's an entrepreneurship club. So I think that's Berkeley Skydeck, right? The one that you're talking about, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so you have things like like Skydeck, that's the entrepreneurship club uh, where you, and the professors where you can like literally explore your um, field at the same time you're in the Bay Area. So like if you work on something and that goes up well, you're not restricted to Berkeley's talent. Like if you get traction, you're in the Bay Area, like you would get the funding and like you would get your name out there. Um, so yeah, definitely like people are quite um, open at the same time. You don't need to be a computer science major to have a startup like I think people always come like no I have to do that but then there's so many like few of my friends who've just been with like have done business like have went to Haas School of Business after and like they've met people who are doing computer science and like found a collaboration like found a partner who wants to do it so don't feel like hey you need to do CS to be an entrepreneur or to start your own thing like I think that's a myth that people have you it's just about finding the right people and like at work you'll definitely find people who are willing to help you with whatever you have. Um, yeah. Interesting. That sounds like an amazing atmosphere. So we have another question about the IB. Um, someone says like you, they don't take computer science in the IB, but they are good at coding. And um, how do you think that would um, affect, like how do you think the CS classes at Berkeley would be for someone who's like that? I mean, it's still tough no matter what. Like, um, you'll probably have an easier side to go to the first few weeks. Um, but then, like, again, there's still like that class is mandatory for everyone, right? Like, there's a lot of students who've done coding since they were 12 years old. So, like, the the rigor would never go away. But yeah, you would sort of have the easier time to kind of not get beaded and not be disappointed. Um, and honestly, it's totally fine not doing CS at IB and exploring that. And I think I should encourage even at Berkeley, any of the school, just explore it. Uh, but yeah, like if you've done computer science, it like the basics, it might help you in the first few weeks, but then the class ramps up quite quickly that um, I think it's pretty much synonymous to other schools I've heard about, like in Michigan and other places. Um, so yeah, like don't feel like hey, you've done it or people who haven't like, yeah, it might give you an advantage for a short time. But eventually, I think there are enough people who've done it since they were 12 or 10 years old. So um, you'll just be one of many. So you had mentioned earlier that Berkeley's larger size means that there's a more competitive atmosphere in some of the classes, especially ones that have like a cap. So one of the questions someone asked is if you could, would you have gone to a smaller school? Um, yeah, so I mean, um, I applied to like I didn't apply to that many schools, but all my schools are mostly in the West Coast. Uh, and the two schools that I had in choice in the end was actually Berkeley and on the opposite was Claremont McKenna, which was really small. Um, like I'm pretty sure like you would know, right? Like Harvey Mudd and like those Claremont colleges. So I had to pick between both. Um, I went with Berkeley at the end of the day. Um, Primarily because it like seemed like hey there are too many clubs and I like a vibrant dynamic environment. And at the same side, like I personally sort of wanted a name which is a bit more recognizable. Back in school, sadly, like I would I wouldn't say like that's the best of choosing college, but that definitely played in my head when I chose Berkeley. Um, and after that, in my first semester actually, when I got adjusted, I did take a trip back to Claremont McKenna to visit a few of my friends and I saw the college life. Um, I'm very personally happy being at Berkeley just because it allowed me to kind of um, become a lot more independent at an earlier stage. Um, because it's such a small school um, like Clement McKenna, like things are kind of taken care of for you. So I don't think I would have gotten that independence from the early on. Um, that being said, it's a fantastic school like if, like to each their own, right? Like if you want like an academic environment, uh, have those intimate relationship with the professors and definitely go for it. But then again, like Berkeley, like when I say consulting clubs, it's keep in mind it's not very easy. Like there are 400 people applying for six to seven spots at each of these clubs. So you might have to think, hey, I want to get into banking consulting. Let's go to Berkeley and like let's join a club. Great, but then getting into the clubs is not like you would just walk in uh, versus let's say if you were at like a smaller college, you don't really need to do any of this. So it has its benefits definitely. It's just that um, the independence or like the thing you need to go and seek out what you want. I think that helped me early on uh, and I think Berkeley allowed like gave me exposure to that. 
Right. So it looks like there's both um, like a lot of advantages and some disadvantages associated with such a large size. Um, and someone asked, I think, a very interesting question that they've heard that Berkeley has a very politically charged atmosphere. How does that affect student life? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, Bernie Sanders kind of um, speaks about like Berkeley spirit um, is definitely very liberal. And I remember um, as, like in my last year, um, I think it was like the Trump's elect, like campaigns were kind of kicking off and there were a lot of protests around even the Black Lives Matter. And yeah, there are a few days I would say like um, where things got a bit out of hand, like people kind of like there were protests and there were violences, like there was violence around. But then it all kind of calms down. Like as a student, it's up to you. Do you want to get involved in it? But yeah, you do sort of sense a general sense of the community. But at the same time, the media blows it up. Um, the entire campus is in. There's a section of campus which is politically charged. Um, and like that would be very active. On the other side, if you go to the engineering side, it seems like nothing happened. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it disrupts your um, learning experience in any way. Of course, it it's out there and you're aware of it. Then you would be at any like other schools. And also I think it's because like Berkeley is in a place which is it is close to Oakland. Um, it's pretty much close to San Francisco, so you're not completely away from the city and like from the local state politics. Um, let's say if like someone was in Ithaca and Cornell, like they were probably a bit away from the state of New York or like from Manhattan. So there would be less of like an intensity of like any other political debate. Yeah, so again, I think it just all boils down to whether you want to participate and how much do you allow it to like disrupt you. So on another note, one of the more interesting questions also asked was do the projects you do in classes have real world implications or are they only within the Berkeley community? Oh, um, no, definitely. So like, I mean, the projects I have a part of, like I worked for the American Diabetes Association where like we designed a program um, like for them to help type 1 diabetes um, to managing their le like levels of sugar from the early on. Um, so they're totally like the projects out there which like have an impact in real time. Um, again, the mode of doing that is like, hey, you can kind of join a club and like work on consulting engagements where you're literally working with either nonprofits or even like companies. So like um, a few friends of mine worked with LinkedIn while they were students or consulting club. So you can like most of the work you do, it is pretty much in real time. Like and I think you can totally have an impact and like you can measure the impact. Um, like yeah, I, there's nothing that's kind of preventing you from doing it. And again, it's like the, I think one thing people could kind of put less focus on is like they uh, like when selecting colleges, like also think about what you sort of want. Like I won't say like be narrow minded, but then if you have an inclination, then like let's say there's an industry that suits you. I think there's definitely benefits of a location. Um, like if you want to be in tech, like being in the Bay Area, like definitely gives you an edge than other schools just because there's so many companies and not just the larger companies have access to startups um, like early stage companies which are willing to give you internships. So I think just kind of factor in the location. It also helps with the projects you work want to work on and have a real world impact because the location sort of all dictates all that, right? Like are you having those interactions with the people who allow you the opportunity to making a difference in school? Interesting. Um, so I think you mentioned before that um, IB classes allow you to skip some introductory Berkeley um, courses. Um, do online courses allow you to do the same thing and can you get credits from those as well? Uh, I'm not sure, uh, honestly, and I hate from what I remember, I don't think online courses do like let's say you do a course era course like it's a certification course. I don't think it would allow you to. Um, like get a credit just because like I don't think the faculty or like the administration would have the uh, bandwidth to exp like to grade and understand how each online course is like they won't be able to assess the rigor. Um, so I don't think online courses like Coursera and stuff help. It's mostly like the very standard uh, set of like IB or like AP exams. Um, I only about Berkeley I can speak about like I don't think Coursera and stuff like that helps them. 
Understood. So, um, what do you think were things that you did in TISB that have helped you during your college years? So, it may be like a study schedule or some way to relax. So, what did you do in TISB that you've stuck with in college and like it helped you in college as well? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, in TISB in general, like I was, I was just pretty involved um, on two fronts. So, like, a I was a prefect, um, like you guys. So, like in general, that part of me, like, hey, I just want to be involved in doing things allowed me to kind of be involved at like the Indian club where like I was a president, like to kind of get in the things I just like organizing. The other part I was very involved heavily was um, the nonprofit space. So like I had my sort of, I founded my own nonprofit. I think the CAS pushed me onto that front where like, hey, um, let's explore this and college applications to be perfectly honest. Like it's like, hey, let's do a lot more of these like uh, nonprofits. So I think early on TSB allowed me to kind of build that interest and I think that allowed me to uh, at Berkeley join a pro bono consulting uh, engagements and even after graduation like even when I was working full time in San Francisco every week and I used to volunteer eight hours of my time at a nonprofit by helping with econometrics. So I was helping companies with like data consulting. So I think that definitely stuck with me uh, and I think TISB especially CAS allowed me to kind of explore that side of me. Um, and apart from that, um, yeah, one thing was YWAM. So like I was pretty involved in like in YWAM, I was involved in the tech department and I used to kind of love kind of doing the lights and like helping with the plays, especially with light lighting and music. So even at Berkeley, like I was part of like a few shoots where like one we had Sunidhi Chauhan coming in and like we done a small video shoot. So like having done like just playing in the like the auditorium and like you have the access to just play with the equipment and be like, hey, I've done this I, and I want to do this. So that kind of stuck with me at um, at Berkeley. Wow, sounds great. Um, so I think we've come to the end of uh, the questions that we've had, that we had from the audience. So um, we'll probably just wrap up the session now. So thank you so much, Josh, and thank you so much everyone who attended and listened and asked questions. Uh, we're going to have a lot more uh, webinars like this one coming up um, over the next few days. So please do attend those as well and ask any questions that you have. Um, yeah, so thank you so much again, Josh. And yeah, it was quite an insightful session to be with you. Is there any closing remark you want to give, like just to wrap this up or like? I mean, I think one thing I would say is like, um, like, use the college counseling department. Like I know like the few people also have their own counselors and stuff, but like use the college counselors. Like they definitely know. And like when you're going through the, so I have done, I've gone through the college application process twice, once in undergrad and once for MBA. And I think explore and actually use this time as an introspection, like as a time for, to introspect about what you like, what you don't like. I think people sort of undermine or underweigh the importance and they just want to get in a school. I would say actually like kind of really spend some time while you're writing DSS to actually think, hey, is this who I am? Um, is this do like, do I really like this? Um, and also like the time you have before starting school, like between IB and school, like try taking taking some time off and like enjoy um, for a few of those months. I think people sort of like uh, they want to kind of get the ground hitting. Like your idea is be very ambitious. Like you all be you'll all do fine. But I think like just when you're going through the application process, like actually use that as a time to kind of reflect and know sort of who you are, because you usually don't get this time that like that often. Yeah, we'll definitely try to like make the best of what we have with us and of course, um, try our best in all ways. So thank you so much, Josh, again, and I think we'll just end the session now. Um, so. Cool, I'm good luck. Good. And uh, nice time. Bye. It was great to have you on board. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.